thank you for having me in your church today and try and get through this without uh, tripping over myself or having all the blood rush out of my face. <laughs> um, you're probably wondering about this painting of First Baptist in front of you and hopefully um, as I describe what it is that I do and how I got here, this will start to make sense and we can talk more about that afterwards. Um, but I want to, I have a quote that I like. There's, I'm going to start with a quote and end with a quote by uh, Joseph Campbell. He wrote, we must be willing to let go of the life we planned so, so as to have the life that is waiting for us. And over the last several years, that's what I've done. Um, a long time ago, there was a little girl who played outside, and we didn't have out any neighbors. We lived out in the countryside, and this was in Pennsylvania. And, you know, I would get lost in my thoughts, and I would just run around, in the, you know, from here to there, and uh, I didn't have any constraints, especially in the summertime. You know, my parents worked, and I was sort of left to my own devices, and I had all sorts of wonderful worlds inside my head. You know, I dreamt of living in a tree house, and I was always finding birds that would fall out of the trees, and I would try to save them in a shoebox, and you know, all of that sort of a thing. And I was very solitary, um, and that was okay. It, it really fostered, I think, in me my uh, creative side because you know, you didn't have Nintendo and all of those things. You, if you wanted to play, you, you created, you invented your playtime. We also spent a lot of time um, on the weekends going to my grandmother's house. Now, I really don't, I couldn't say whether or not we went every other weekend or if maybe it was just one particular trip that left a lasting impression on me, but in my mind, of course, all of those snippets of memories have come together to form this new, you know, narrative that I've adopted as my story. And, but at my grandmother's house, there were always things going on um, that were very ritualistic. Uh, if we were baking and you put a cake or a, a loaf of bread in the oven, you would make the sign of the cross over it. I grew up Catholic, by the way, Byzantine Catholic, for anybody <laughs> who understands the distinction between the two. Um, in church, we'd go to church on Sunday and that it was a very, um, the word I would use to describe is very staid. It was very, you know, um, very proper, kind of like a Greek Orthodox church without all of the pomp. Um, we had a cantor. Uh, it was an old man who sat in the front of the church or up in the, um, up in the balcony, and he canted the entire mass, and so everyone chanted it. And it was very, very formal, very old-sounding, very monastic. And especially around Christmas and Easter, there were these rituals that, I, I think of them as rituals, and things that we did that really left a lasting impression on me. Um, you know, we baked bread a certain way, and we decorated the bread a certain way with braids and, and, a, and a cross on the top, and everything that you ate had a certain meaning, and on Christmas Eve, we would have a holy night supper, and it always had 13 courses, and it always had to be done the same way, and on Easter, um, I, my grandmother taught me to write on um, Easter eggs with wax, making pasanki eggs, and they were just, it was just this beautiful, delicate, you know, thing, it was this shared time that we had together. Um, we may, always had on Easter morning, um, you know, you would have a blessed Easter basket, and it always had to have, you know, a lamb, a butter in the shape of a lamb, and, and a piece of bread that was made a certain way, and a ham, and the, all of these things, and it was covered with a beautifully embroidered uh, piece of textile that my grandmother made, and it always had red thread on it, and so I thought that those things was what it meant to be a Catholic. <laughs> And so imagine, so, you know, fast forward then, I'm in my, you know, junior high school years, high school, you join the groups at church, and you start talking to other kids in school, and you start sharing stories, and 
I had other friends who were Catholic, but none of them went to the particular church that I went to. I realized later they went to the Roman Catholic church. <laughs> Big distinction. Yeah. And I would say, well, you know, didn't you get your Easter basket blessed last night or this past weekend? Or, you know, what? We don't bless Easter baskets. It's like, one of us is wrong. You know, either you're not Catholic or, you know. <laughs> grandmother or your mother at Christmas at Easter time? No. In fact, oh, and I even had an opportunity to, um, I was so fascinated with the, the whole Easter egg thing. I had an opportunity um, when I, I think I was in sixth or seventh grade, uh, a nun was coming to town and she was putting together a show for the cable TV network um, demonstrating writing on Easter eggs and our priest asked me if I wanted to accompany her. And so they brought this fabulous costume. It was the big flouncy skirt, and it was all embroidered, and the white shirt, and a vest, and I had to wear this special hat and red boots. And I got, and it was a very traditional Ukrainian, um, like dancing kind of a costume. And they got it from a museum somewhere, and I wore that, and I got to sit next to her, and um, she did all of the talking, and I just sat there for 30 minutes, and I was you know, writing on the eggs, and dipping it, and holding it over the candle, and wiping it off, and stuff. To me, that's what it meant to be a Catholic. Well, I had no idea that really what I was identifying with was my cultural heritage, that being Catholic really, on some level, had nothing to do with it. And I got a little disenfranchised then, and I became a little disillusioned because I thought, well, I've been going to church every Sunday, and I've been doing all of this, and maybe I'm not the person that I thought that I was. So time goes by, and you know, you start to grow up, and I go to college. And because of being around my grandmother, and my, oh, my grandmother worked in a factory. She was the, um, I can't remember, like the supervisor of her shift in her floor. And they made children's clothing. So around my grandmother's house, there was always bolts and bolts of fabric for children's clothing and spools of ribbons and laces and cord. And she was always giving me things, like if I w ever wanted something, you know, I could just take it. So I had this hoard of, and I was always attracted to the white fabrics with the red designs on them. Um, I had schools of red cord, which my husband will tell you I still have stuffed away in the back of my studio. And so anyway, so it, it was just seemed like a natural progression for me. I thought I was going to be a fabric designer, and then I went to New York City, and I was a little um, intimidated by all of that. So I discovered that there was something called textile design. So I went to school in Philadelphia, which was a little bit closer to home, and it was like, you know, New York light. And I could, you know, I could go there and I could feel comfortable there. And um, I studied fabric design. Um, and I think that the way that I lay out my paintings, um, if you take, when you go to look at them, there's a lot of things that are going on in my paintings that really harken back to my years as a fabric designer. Um, I rarely center something um, because in textiles, your, fa your design work, it's only a snapshot of something that really is meant to be seen repeated over and over and over again. And it always extends off of the page. And if you drew a design, inevitably what you did was cut it up into four and rearrange it and put it back together again so that all of the edges meet um, so it can be printed and repeated. And that's something that I've kept with me, no matter how I've created my artwork over the years. Um, and I, you know, I like that idea that a painting, and I think you said something about this also, that a painting is really just a snapshot in a moment. And I love when people look at my artwork and if they might sense 
a narrative going on somewhere, and then you get to make up the story. What happened before? You know, the woman with the bear. What's going on there? You know, well, I, you know, what happened before you got to that point, and what happened next? Um, are they peeking through a window? You know, are they playing? It, you know, what is the what is the context of it? it? Doesn't matter what I thought about it, but you know, what do you take out of it? Um, so anyway, um, about five years ago, I had a life changing event, and I found myself going back to that idea of, you know, who am I, and what. You know, what's my purpose and where, what am I doing? It was really the same type of epiphany that I had when I realized that, well, maybe I'm not Catholic, maybe I'm just, you know, Ukrainian. <laughs> and, but then what does that mean? And so, and I started doing all of this reading and I read about religion and I read about, you know, being Slavic and I read about the Russians and, you know, Catholics and everything. And I just, I had to take away, the, it was so overwhelming, and I had to take away the little bits and pieces that were important to me. And during that time was when I discovered Joseph Campbell and the idea of mythology and visual metaphor. And it really struck a chord with me. And so I started to take that, and I consciously made the effort to start incorporating these textile designs and these images from the Slavic Easter eggs and the Hungarian folk art and all of these other things. And it, little by little, they started finding their way into my artwork. Um, it was not, in the beginning, it was not like you see it here. In the beginning, it was more like this painting that I did of First Baptist where I was trying to marry the idea of what, what for me stood as the quintessential religious icon, you know, locally, and how could I see myself fitting into that community? And so I transformed it through collage and painting and drawing and illustration as um, there's, when you, if you get a chance to look at it, there are um, just, these are some traditional designs you would use on Easter eggs, and these are designs from embroidery, and this is, these are designs from the tops of an Easter egg. And I, hid, I was picturing Easter time, and you know, there's I hid photographs of Easter eggs out in this garden with the sheep and all of that. So I sort of transformed it into something where I felt like I, I could belong there, and then so I like made up my own religion. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I can do that sort of thing. <laughs> but, um, but eventually, you know, my artwork, as the more, the more I worked on it, um, and the more I became more comfortable with my process, and the more I discovered all of the, and it really embraced the designs that came before me that my ancestors did. And I wasn't looking to recreate their work. I've never done a piece of red embroidery work, but I take the imagery and the design of those things, and now I incorporate them into my paintings. There's in all of my paintings there is a layer of sort of these. I call them my artistic alphabet, and there are images of different flowers and a fish, and there's different birds, and I'm always like adding something new or taking something away, and I draw those red designs. Under, over, un, under, over, <laughs> um, in the middle of my painting process. And it also gives me, it's like a net. It's like, that's my safety net. That's like all of the women that came before me who <coughs> were not painters, you know, but they did things in their home to make their life more beautiful, you know creating the bread a certain way, or embroidering the beautiful towel that we used on the Easter basket. Um, theirs was more fine craft, taking something that was very useful and turning it into a beautiful object. And so they are all there. You know, all of those ancestral women, whether I'm related to them or not, are all in the paintings in sort of that layer that's sort of my hearkening back to those people who sort of hold me up in my safety net. 
And as I got more comfortable with painting and, and I got more comfortable with myself through going through this artistic process, I found myself returning to church. Now, of course, I ended up going to a church where I still was the only person in the church who probably really didn't fit in there. Um, um, because I ended up going to a church downtown because one of my dear friends was the pastor there and I just adore this man. And, but I was like one of a handful of, you know, straight white women in the church. And it was just, it was like only I could pick the place to, to feel comfortable in where I'm still the outsider, so to speak. And I was okay with that. And, um, <coughs> And, and, you know, and maybe that's part of who I am, is I'm sort of always going to be that person who's a little bit on, you know, the fringes of what's going on, you know, traditionally. But, um, so, I was painting, and it was going well, and all of a sudden, and I was a teacher at the time, and I, I got this notion in my head that it wasn't enough. And... It was the time for me to become a full-time artist, and that if if I didn't do it then, I was never going to make the leap. I would chicken out, and I would lose my nerve. And um, I thought about it. I talked about it. I convinced myself that I was going to do it. And it took about two years, and then eventually I did. And I left the safety net of the job with the county with the steady paycheck and the insurance and all of it and instead i left into the safety net of the red embroidered you know drawings and all of that that are in my paintings and the people that came before me and i just knew that it was all going to work itself out and that it was going to be fine and um so far it has mm -hmm. and um as long as I follow that, that path and I keep that joy that I get from painting in my heart, and as long as um, I sort of maintain that level of excitement inside, like where you can feel yourself and you get excited about something, I try on a daily basis. I'm not good at it all the time. I apologize to me. But I do try to hold that with me. And if you expect good things to happen, they do. And that really has become my religion and my connection to the people around me and the universe and God and all of it. And so it doesn't really have to have a name. It doesn't have to be here. It could be walking in the woods at my house. It could be that oneness that I get when I'm painting and I'm in the zone and everything disappears around me. That's my religious experience. And I think that I, if, if I hadn't gotten to that point, you know, I would still be struggling and I would still be doubting myself and I would still be wondering who I am. But really, um, I think as I'm getting older, I'm really, th this is who I am. I am the woman in the painting with the feathered cape and the bird and the glasses and I am, even though that's a painting of my grandmother, and I am the girl in the, the sled being pulled by the swan or the angel, um, you know, being tender with the bird and these tree paintings I did when my father died and, you know, that's me and these other paintings over here, you know, they're, they're me, they're not really me, but it is me. Um, I've gotten a little off my track here, but I, I, so I guess what I'd like to say, I'm going to close this up with my favorite Joseph Campbell quote, and then afterwards at 12.30 you can all come back and you can grill me. Um, <laughs> and this, this, well, this, is my, this is my church right here. If you do follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while, waiting for you. And the life that you ought to be living is the one you are living. Follow your bliss and don't be afraid. And doors will open where you didn't know they were going to be.
live really in the 12th grade. <laughs> <laughs> Our closing hymn is number 187. It sounds along the ages. So please rise in body or spirit. Thank <laughs> you.